testing. Mark! That was meant to shock you to get you ready to worship Jesus this morning. All right, there you go. So, and by the way, that is very themed and connected to what we'll learn together as we search the scripture together. So, welcome everybody. Welcome to First Baptist Church. My name is Sean. I'm the pastor here. And I'm glad to see each and every one of you on this very rainy Sunday morning. And I know we have some folks today that... Uh, for whatever reason, they couldn't make it because of the rain or whatever. We want to remember those folks in prayer in just a minute. But if you are our guest today, we want to say how glad we are that you're here with us. We're excited that you've chosen to worship with us today. And uh, I say it every now and then, but we don't believe in coincidences. We believe in on, on purposes. And because of that, we know that God brought you here on purpose because he had a word he wanted to share with you. And so our prayer for you is that you would feel welcome today and you would sense the presence of the Lord. Because that's what we're out, after all, that's what we're after is the presence of the Lord. And we want, we want to meet him today. We're going to ask him to visit with us in a very personal way in just a moment. And if you are a guest uh, and you did not receive, we have a little gift that we like to give everyone who's a, who's a guest. We have a, a mug with some information about our church inside of it. A, a mug is in a coffee mug. So it's some information with our church inside of it. And we have that in the foyer as you leave the sanctuary if you didn't happen to get it on the way in. Uh, but either way, if you're our guest today, there is a little a card. It's called a Connect card on the back side of the pew in front of you. And if you're willing uh, to fill that out, you can drop that in our offering plate here in just a few minutes. Or you can leave it in the seat. We have some folks that will come by afterwards. We weren't gonna, uh, we're not going to just show up at your house unannounced and harangue you or anything like that. Uh, but we do want to pray for you by name uh, and uh, just let you know that we were glad you were here. So again, welcome, welcome, welcome. Have just a few announcements, though, before we get into, uh, into the singing portion of our worship today and the giving portion of our worship. Uh, we want to remind everybody about the baby shower coming up uh, for Rebecca and Jeremy Waddell. And uh, that's May the 5th at 2 o'clock. Uh, ladies, uh, 
Mark that on your calendar. Uh, if you don't already have it, it's also in your bulletin so you have something written down and you don't forget. Uh, you know, what day was that? It's in your bulletin. So any questions you might have about that, uh, there's some information there. There's a, a number you can contact or an email that you can contact to find out more about it or just call the church office. Also, second, very important, I want to remind you guys uh, that next Sunday evening uh, at 6 o'clock, uh, it is into the harvest time again. It's been a couple of months, two or three months since we've been out together. So I'm going to invite each and every member, each and every person here uh, to come to the church at 6 o'clock. And uh, we're going to go out into the harvest. This is an opportunity for us to go out and meet our neighbors and our community, uh, to offer to pray for them. And also, as the Lord leads, have an opportunity to share Jesus with them. And we believe this is something that God has called us to do. We've been doing this for the last couple of years. And so um, we want you to come. If you're a little nervous about it, show up and you can go with somebody else who's had a little more experience or is a little more confident and you can learn as you go. That's part of discipleship. And maybe, just maybe God's calling you to pray that night and you say, listen, I physically can't go out or I can physically go out, but I want to come and pray. We need you too. So you can show up at 6 o'clock, and while the rest of the group is going out, you pray, you pray, you pray, because at the end of the day, if there's going to be salvation, if there's going to be anything spiritual that's going to happen, it's only going to happen as a result of prayer. And so we invite you to come and be a part of that. Last but not least, uh, men, uh, there's a fishing trip coming up, and it's coming up in June, the 11th through the 13th. We'll also have this information in your bulletin as well. But there is a limit on the number of guys that can come. We already have some names, uh, some people that have already committed to go. We can only take a total of 12. And so if you want to talk to Paul Gilbert or Dennis Christian about the trip, they have all the answers. Um, and if you come to me and ask me about it, I'm just going to say talk to one of those two guys because they have all the answers. But we'd love for you to come. It's a time of fellowship. It's a time, uh, it's an opportunity to talk to people about the Lord. It's a time to have fun as men. So we want to invite you to be a part of that. Well, at this time, uh, as our men come forward uh, to receive our offering, let me just say just a couple of words, and then we'll have a, a time of prayer. These guys are going to come forward, uh, and uh, it's our time of giving and our service. And the other day I was at a meeting, and uh, one of the guys at the meeting, the leader of the meeting, was making a comment. It was about a seminary. And he was talking about people that had given the seminary and how grateful they were. And we are all grateful for people who give. And he made this comment. He said, um, he made some comment to this effect. I don't know if I quoted exactly right. But his comment was, what greater investment? What, what thing could you invest in that's greater? And he was speaking of people that have been called out to take the gospel, not just pastors, but missionaries and church leaders of every shape and kind. Well, think about it. The, the entity on earth that is his physical manifestation on earth is his church, the local church, the local body. So what greater thing could you invest in than the local church? What has greater dividends? It may not come back to you in dollars and cents. It might, it might not, but that's not the point. But the idea is that, listen, that the gospel continues to be preached everywhere at all times. And every time you do give, make no mistake, uh, not every dollar stays here. Some of it goes to the furthest parts of the world, and some of it goes to places, if you were to ask me and you say, Sean, it's, have you heard of this place? I would say, I don't even know what that place is, okay? But it goes everywhere, and that's okay because that's what it's all about. And so, and to take care of the needs that we have also, of course, right here within our own fellowship. So I encourage you to seek the leadership of the Lord and what you should give as the Lord leads you to do so. Um, but with that said, I, I want us to pray, but I wanted to read this scripture um, and this is not really about giving money. This is about something much greater than that. The scripture uh, is a verse that I'm going to refer to in the text today that we'll preach later. But this comes from Romans chapter 8. This is verse 32. It says, he, that refers to God or the Father. It says, he did not even spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him Grant us everything. What, what would God deny us? What is God, what is our Father kept from us that we need? Everything that we need for salvation through Jesus we have. And this is, this is a praiseworthy statement. And I want to ask you right now, and I'm going to pray it, but I want to ask you as the Lord uh, prompts you, even during our time of singing or whatever it is, that as we prepare for the preaching of God's word today, that you would ask God, let me enter in. Let me have an understanding of your experience of what it costs you to give your son. And because the whole sermon revolves around that. 
Let's pray together. Father, we come before you now and we sit before you and we say you are God and we are not. And you have a word for us that's very important. I pray, Lord, that you would give us a hunger and a thirst and a desire for holy things. Most importantly, you. Father, transform us, renew our minds today and transform us more and more into the image of your Son. Lord, today, as we listen, Lord, may what we do be more than listen. Draw us in, Holy Spirit, and have your way in us, O oh God, and teach us about your Son but most of all today, teach us about your heart. Your holy heart that would willingly plan and execute the salvation of all mankind through Jesus, your son. Lord, our desire today is to draw close and we need your help. Holy Spirit, we don't pretend today that we know what we're doing. We don't pretend today that we have all the answers, but we come to you because you know all things. Please lead and guide all that we do today in this time of worship. May it all be done for your glory and the edifying of your saints. And all God's people said, Amen. Come praise and glorify our God. The Father of our Lord In Christ he has in heavenly realms His blessings on us poor For pure and blameless in his sight He destined us to be And now we've been adopted through His Son eternally The praise of your glory, to the praise of your mercy and grace, to the praise of your glory, you are the God who saves. Come praise and glorify our God who gives his grace in Christ. Spirit of the Lord. The Spirit guarantees our hope until redemption's done. Until we join an endless praise to God the three in one. To the praise of your glory, to the praise of your mercy and grace.
Would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power in the blood, say it, power in the blood. Would your evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is Shining glorious light When he calls me 
home. I'll fall at his throne and forever worship Christ and forever worship Christ. I'll forever worship Christ. I'll forever worship Christ. Not the same. I am changed. We keep by the blood. I have been here, and every promise. 
Yes, you fulfilled. I believe, I believe that you rose again in victory. And that same power lives in. Do you believe? I've born again. I've been made free. I believe, I believe that the gates of hell say Jesus is Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Just give him a hand, please. Thank you, Jesus. Your mercies are new every morning, and I feel a lot better now than I did walking in. Um, Father, just, just come and be with your people. Christ, come be with your people through your Holy Spirit who dwells in us, dwells among us. Please help us let go of what we're holding on to, let go of what we're carrying. Give it to you and trust you with it. Please relax every tension, every fear, every anxiety. Bring peace in this place, Lord, and help us hear and see this ancient, ancient story that, that, that Sean is going to speak to us about. Help us see it as if for the first time and help us see it in all of its incredible wonder and beauty and and terribleness and amazingness and fill us with the fear of God and the hope of God and the love of God and love for one another. Thank you for your sweet mercy and forgiveness through your blood, Jesus. Touch us, Lord. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. That was a... uh powerful song. I think about it. It has that, um, that crescendo. That crescendo. That's my musical language, Jaeger. That crescendo, it just keeps building and building. And then you think we built to the top, but we weren't there yet. And I think to myself, you know, you could keep, you could write that song and you could take, and you could go back and you could start somewhere in eternity past, and we could do nothing but take an entire service and sing, I believe, about all the truths of the Lord God. And we wouldn't get finished before lunch, I promise. And so I want you to think about that. Well, today, I'd like for you to take your Bible, turn with, turn with me to Genesis chapter 22. Now, just so you'll be there when we start, 
For those of you that may be our guest today, we've been in a series on Genesis for, I don't know, maybe a year. And as we look at this series, uh, there's a lot of stuff that's unfolding. And a lot of times we take a story uh, at face value alone. And, and I believe that we ought to at least take stories at face value. I mean, I believe we have to start there. I believe that every word written in the Bible is truth. And it's all written for our learning and for our admonition. That includes the stories of the Old Testament. But part of the reason that the stories in the Old Testament are written are to prepare us to get our eyes on Jesus. They were to prepare a people to be ready when Jesus came the first time. Now the story today is one in which many of you are probably familiar. And if you're not, that's okay. Uh, that's perfectly okay. We're going to read it together. But I've entitled my message today, The Greatest Story Ever Foretold. Now, you say, didn't you entitle another message that? I did. I entitled the greatest story ever foretold when we learned of the birth of Isaac, a miracle, ver a miracle birth, a miraculous birth that pointed to the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is part of the picture. But today, we're in 22. That was in 21. We're in 22, and we're going to continue the story. The miracle child had been born, and now we're going to look at this command of God that seems rather unrealistic. Now, a lot of people uh, refer to this passage as the binding of Isaac. That's what our Jewish forebears uh, call it. There's actually a Hebrew word, the akendah, the binding of Isaac, the binding of Isaac. And that's what we're going to read about today. And I've got to tell you up front that uh, if you will be here over the next couple of weeks, we will cover this passage again uh, from a different angle because, listen, the Word of God is like uh, a layered onion, right? And you keep peeling back the layers and you find more and more details. But today we're going to view the passage from one particular uh, point of view. Now, what I want to do is I want to read the passage first. We're going to read the first 14 chapters of chapter 22, and I think maybe one or two other verses will also come on the screen. So if you have your Bible, you can read from your, your own Bible, or you're welcome to read from the screen. The scripture says this beginning in verse 1, after these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, because notice the exclamation point there. Here I am, he answered. Take your son, he said, God said, your only son, Isaac, whom you love. Go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains that I will tell you about. So Abraham got up early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took with him two of his young men and his son Isaac. He split the wood for a burnt offering, and he set out to go to the place God had told him. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. Then Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. The boy and I will go over there to worship. Then we'll come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and he laid it on his son Isaac. In his hand, he took the fire and the sacrificial knife and the two of them walked on together. Then Isaac spoke to his father, Abraham, and said, my father, here I am, my son Isaac, Abraham said. Isaac said, the fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. Then the two of them walked on together. When they arrived at the place that God had told him about, Abraham built the altar there and arranged the wood. He bound his son Isaac and he placed him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out and took the knife to slaughter his son. Pause for a moment and imagine just for a second Isaac on the altar on a, a stone with Abraham standing over him with a knife about to pierce it through his heart. Verse 11. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he replied, here I am. Then he said, do not lay a hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your only son from me. 
Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught in the thicket by its horns. So Abraham went and took the ram and he offered it as a burnt offering in this place of his son. And Abraham named that place Jehovah Jireh. The Lord God will provide. So today it is called, it will be provided on the Lord's mountain. Now let's... Abraham, this is after the story was complete. It says Abraham went back to his young men and they got up and they went together to Beersheba and Abraham settled in Beersheba. Now pull up the, the Hebrews verse for me. <clears throat> That's not the one. So take that one off and we'll come back in a minute. Just go to the next wrong verse. So what I want to do is I want to talk to you just for a moment about this story. Now I want to say... Every time I preach a sermon, I have a central idea. Every time I preach a sermon, I want to have some idea that I want you to walk away with and go, I know what he was trying to communicate to me. What is the main idea? For today, the main idea is that we might visualize and understand the father's heart and the son's submission. And last time when I told you the greatest story ever foretold, I told you that this is what we call typology. I told you it's like shadow and substance. What I told you was it is like a storybook picture or a picture of the reality. And just like we saw in the chapter 23 when we saw uh, the son being born, the, the, you know, we saw that the father was like a picture of God and Isaac was like a picture of the son, right, Jesus. In the same way, we have a typology here. And the typology is Abraham and Isaac, the father and the son. They relate. Abraham is a picture. This is a storybook picture. It's real. It happened. But it's a storybook picture wanting to get us to look at something even greater. Because, friends, there is a greater Abraham and there is a greater Isaac. And that's what I want us to see. But most importantly today, my prayer for you this week, and my prayer is it prompts you, as your spirit prompts you, for you to pray, is still God, help me understand the heart of the Father. Help me understand what this is like. And if you just listened to the story, you had to have heard the aching heart of a father when he was commanded to do something that seems ungodlike, different from other stories. And that is because God is wanting to push our thoughts toward a future event where God would do something so incredibly different and so incredibly radical, but it would take that one event to save mankind from their sin. So that's our idea today. And listen, so what I want to tell you is the story is all about perspective. Where in chapter 23, the greatest story ever foretold, the story was focused mainly on Isaac, the son and the son plays a prominent role in 22 as well. I'm sorry, 21 and now 22. In 22 as well. But the father, Abraham, I think plays a more significant role. And the perspective is of that. Now I want you to think about that from your own life. How you, probably where you are in life, where you, where you are in your own life, has something to do with how you read the story. What I mean by that is this. If you're younger, if you're a child, if you're single, you might have a tendency to look at Isaac and go, I can't believe Isaac would go up on the mountain with his father like that. But something happens to us when we have children. Something happens to us. I have a dear friend, and I won't go into all the details. I've asked some of you to pray. I have a dear friend right now who's going through a very difficult situation with his young son in the hospital dealing with heart, congenital heart issues and now dealing with a potential liver cancer situation that we're praying about. And what I've heard his dad say to me on a number of occasions is, hasn't my boy been through enough? I would trade places with him right now if I could. I'd give my life in two seconds for my son. If there's a place where I can go, I can give my own self, I can give my organs, I can give whatever it is, sign me up yesterday, I'll do it. And I think most of us in here who are parents feel the same way about our children. So we get invited into this idea of the heart of God. And listen, God needed to express something to us that I don't know that we could understand any other way. So let me give you some information as I walk through this. We have the idea. Let's get some information. This is just the stuff to put these pieces together. So how is it that Abraham is like the father and Isaac is like the son? Well, first of all, listen to me. Father Abraham offered his only son Isaac on the altar and the father gave his only son Jesus on the eternal offer. Now notice the difference. One offered and one gave. That's intentional on my part because when you read the end of the story, 
Abraham did not end up having to sacrifice his son on the altar, but he was willing to do it, right? That is a picture. Now, I want you to see in this, it's very unique. Those are maybe a verse that you recognize right there. But God says, take your son, your only son. Take your son, your only son. Now, wait a minute. I thought Abraham had another son. He had Ishmael, right? No. Ishmael had essentially been sent out of his house. All of his hopes and all of his dreams were placed upon the son of promise. Isaac was now the son of inheritance. He was the son who was the heir of, of, of promise. And so God said, take your son. He'd already gotten rid of that. And listen, God had been doing a process all along to bring Abraham to a place, right, where he had nothing but his son, but ultimately nothing but himself. To rely on. God said, take your son Isaac and take him and make a burnt offering of him. Take him to the altar. But we know about Jesus, right? We know the story. One of our favorite verses, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, right? His only son. Now listen, is that not to say that God doesn't have children? But we become his children through Jesus, right? That is how we get, that's how we enter into. The Bible says that Jesus in one respect is like our older brother. He brings many sons to glory, the book of Hebrews says. But we think about this for a minute. God gave his only son. What he's trying to tell us is, is as difficult as this was for Abraham, who was now, listen, Abraham was not in a position to go out and be having a bunch more kids. Now, I have to tell you, if you read chapter 25, you find out he actually does have some more. Okay? But that's it. We're not there yet. But here's the thing. God says, listen, take the thing, take the person that um, all your hopes and dreams have given and all my promises, all of my promises that you will have descendants one day, that you will have a people, as many uh, stars as there are in the sky and as much sand as there is on the sea, all of this will come through this one son. You waited, you waited 75 years, you were 100 plus years old, and you waited all this time, now take that boy that you love so much, that everything, you don't have anybody else, take him and go kill him. This is him offering his son, his only son, on the altar. The wording is very intentional. I read to you already Romans chapter 8, verse 32. For if he or if God would not spare even his only son, will he even withhold anything from us? That's powerful, is it not? You say, how do I know I can trust someone? They've given me the best that they have. They will not withhold anything from me. They love me so much with such a love that they would even give their own son. Now, what other ways do we know of overlap? Isaac and Jesus both, they both went to Mount Moriah. Now, all of these details are important. Moriah is Calvary. Moriah is Golgotha in the New Testament. Moriah is the place where Jesus also died. Now, we see it a couple of times in here. He says, take him to uh, Moriah. And it, on one hand, Moriah is a set of mountains. But he's t he tells him to go to a specific place. And when he got to the mountains of Moriah, he found the specific mountain that he was supposed to worship him on. And he notice it. He uses the word worship synonymous with sacrifice, right? Because that's what worship is. Worship is the giving up of something, right? Giving up of what's valuable to you. You don't bring to God. Listen to me. If you just give God your leftovers, that's not worship. That's not worship. Worship is giving him all that you have and the best that you have. The children of Israel were commanded, and we just celebrated Passover. The children of Israel were commanded to take that Passover lamb, pull him out, make him like a part of the family, feed him, separate him, and then take him out and kill him. Don't bring me a, a lamb who has defects, you know? And so, but this particular place, location, if you were to read, John 19 tells us that Jesus went to a place called Golgotha. But you notice the verse in the middle, 2 Chronicles 3, chapter 1. There's a whole bunch of things. God has this way. If you go to the Holy Land, you see it. But God has this way of building on top of one another. The same place where Abraham was to sacrifice Isaac was the same place where the temple was to be built. And then just right there in almost the same area was the same place that Jesus was sacrificed. And then if you want to go even a step further, it's probably probably also the same place that Stephen was martyred. But all of these things build on top of one another. Why is that? So that a person who's familiar with the Old Testament scriptures can make the connection that there is a greater than Isaac. There is a son who was killed by his father 
So they both went to Mount Moriah. So what's next? Isaac and Jesus both went to the altar voluntarily. Now I think this is really, really, really significant, church. Now you read the story. When I was a kid, we read this story. When I was a kid, I was sitting there going, that can't be. This story was scary when I was a kid. I didn't like the story of a dad taking his son up a mountain to kill him. And you may not like that story either. But when I was a kid, I totally misunderstood the story. Because when I was a kid, I thought the person in the story was another kid just like me. But I got to tell you something. It's not a little kid. We're talking about full adulthood. We're talking about an Isaac. We're probably talking about an Abraham who's 120, who's 125 years old by now, maybe 130. You're talking about an Isaac who very easily could have been in his uh, uh, early 30s. Some people who like to take the type a little further think that Isaac was probably 33. Doesn't say that in the text. Something worth thinking about. The The full degree of manhood he'd enter into Now listen to me. He's walking up a mountain with a 120-something-year-old man, and he's 30, 25, 30, whatever it is. Listen, he can take his dad, right? He can take him. He can run or he can resist, right? He can do any of this stuff. No, 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 no. He recognizes what's happening here, and he goes willingly. I I wrote it down. It's 2,520 feet above sea level or to the summit of Mount Moriah. Think about it, 2,500 steps, he's got a lot of opportunity to change his mind. And yet he walks. Think about that. Every step, and he figures it out. Dad, I see the wood, and and I I, I, I see the fire, and I, I see all the stuff for the offering, but where is the lamb for the sacrifice? God will provide a lamb, son. He knew. He knew. Dad was looking at him with a look in his eyes. He knew what was happening as he walked up the steps. Now you think about it. When Jesus Christ went, the Bible tells us in a number of places that Jesus Christ went voluntarily. He said, no man takes my life, I lay it down. Jesus said, if I wanted to, I could call down 12 legions of angels to take me down from this cross. Over and over again, he had every opportunity to escape. He had every opportunity to run. He had a rubber top of the, listen, not just opportunity to run. He could have resisted. He could have blown them all away. And he could start over with a whole new group of people if he wanted to. A whole new race of man that wouldn't rebel against him. And yet he went up to Mount Moriah. He went to Calvary's Hill. He went to the place of the skull called Golgotha. He went there but he went voluntarily. What else do we know that's connecting the two? Look at this. Father God and Father Abraham were both responsible for executing the sacrifice on the altar. Now, what I want to share with you is this. Who was responsible for the death of Isaac? It would have been Abraham. Abraham had the knife, and Abraham had the fire. The father was going to have to personally do the deed. Eternally. I need you to understand this. Historically is one thing. Historically, yes. Historically, there was a conspiracy that took place to kill Jesus. Historically, the Romans and the Jews got in league together. That, by the way, that means Jew and Gentile, so that represents all of mankind. They got into a conspiracy together. They sent Jesus to a kangaroo court. They lied about him. They tried him. They sent him to the cross. But listen to me. There is something behind the veil. There's something much deeper than that. The book of Acts tells us that God in his foreknowledge, he determined that Jesus would die. He determined that the son would die. Somewhere in the annals of eternity, the decision was made that God would come in the flesh. Lo, I come in the book, it is written of me. I give a body, I bring a body. I bring a body to sacrifice. The writer of Hebrews quotes the writer of Psalms. Jesus came, and what was the point of him coming in a human body? It was to relate to us and all mankind because it needed a man for a sacrifice because men had sinned, but it was all so that there would be a body to encompass God but God would have to die and he would die incarnate 
Now, I want you to think about this. I told you this is about perspective and what it would cost God. That the sinfulness of man, what it would cost God, the book of Isaiah says that he was pierced for our transgressions, right? But the book also says he was smitten of God. He was struck by God. You think it was primarily the guy with the whip and the cat of nine tails? Do you think it was primarily some Roman centurion who had sadism in his mind and sadism in his heart? Those were just instruments. But primarily, the Bible says, that God himself saw fit to kill his own son. And why would he do it? Because of his hatred of unholiness. Because of his hatred of sin. Now listen to me. What does it cost God What does it cost God? What does sin cost God? Listen, God must move with a mighty vengeance. He will pour his wrath out on sin. No sin can stand in his holy character. When you think about, does God love me? To what price would he pay because he loved me? His son met with a violent and bloody end. Because he loved sinners, people that he knew about, and he, all of his pre planning, but he knew all of it, and yet God did this to his son. You and I read the story in the Gospels and we say, oh, this happened and that happened, but very often do we not realize what was happening in eternity. God executes sins. You say, why did he execute Jesus? Because he who knew no sin became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. Isaac and Jesus were both flanked by two witnesses. You know the story. There were two men on the cross behind him. There were two men that walked with him. Two is the number of witness in Scripture. You have to have two people to put somebody, uh, convict somebody of guilt in a trial which is a good thing. It's a good thing. We we use that in our legal system too. They were both flanked, but listen, I'm going to point to something else in a minute based on this. But there were two there, two that were able to watch from a distance, so to speak, just like the New Testament. But notice this, next one. Because it goes back to something I said a minute ago. The sacrifice was transactional between the fathers and the sons alone. You see, there were two witnesses there. There were two witnesses that walked. But Abraham Abraham told the two men, the servants, you can go this far, but you can't go any further. They got to the bottom of the hill. He said, you wait here while the boy and I go worship. You got to stay here. You can only go so far. Now, we know that on the night Jesus died, we know there was a point at which when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, there he had three of his closest disciples there with him, and he said, you two stay over here. A, stro- a stone's throw away. Do you know a stone's throw is the distance of death? He said, you stay over here, a stone's throw away, and you pray and you watch. But they couldn't go over there to the tree where Jesus was praying in Gethsemane. But also, on the day in which Jesus died, at his crucifixion, of course there were two witnesses there, but something happened Even with those guys, of course, ultimately they died before Jesus died physically. But I want you to know on that day, the whole place went pitch black. It was one of the signs of heaven. It happened in the the story of the Passover. It was repeated. Instead of being three days, it was three hours when Jesus was on the cross. And nobody this day can tell you exactly what happened during those three hours. There was something happening between the father and the son. That's what happened on Mount Moriah with Abraham and Isaac. We don't know. We're not led into all of their conversation. There may have been other words said. There may have been silence. We're not given the details. But there was something happening between the father and the son. The son cried out to the father. The father didn't respond. But there's so much deep stuff happening between those two. I want you to think about it. It went pitch black. No one could see all of what was happening Only the father knew and the son knew. It was something that was connected in eternity past. That darkness lasted, and I thought about that for a minute. If he was 33 years old, if either man was 33 years old, that's 12,045 days. For 12,045 days of their life, every day that they walked on the face of the earth, every morning... The sun rose, 
Every morning the sun got up. He came out, to use kind of scriptural language, he kind of came out of his place. He rose up and uh, every day the sun would be at its height at noon and look down and I can imagine that the sun were personified. The sun every day looking at the Lord Jesus every day. The sun would say something like, what's he going to do today? Is he going to heal somebody today? Is he going to give a blind man sight again? Is he, is he going to raise somebody from the dead? He did that the other day. Every day the sun looked up and said, man, and the sun, by the way, the sun looked down at this man who was his creator. Right? Every day he looked at it. And then one day, one day he got up and he said, man, what's he going to do today? And what did he look down and see? And he see these people murdering his maker. And it's almost like he blushed in shame and hid himself from what was happening and said, I let no one see what's happening today. There was a transactional thing happening between father and son. You and I think the gospel is first and foremost about us. Friends, the gospel is first and foremost about God. It's about glorifying himself. You and I are beneficiaries of the gospel. It's about God first. What else? Isaac died figuratively. Jesus died in reality. You say, how do you know that? Well, the, the Bible says that uh, they went on a three-day journey. On the third day, they saw the place. Three days is not, listen, that's not um, a coincidence that the same wording is used. Three days, third day. It's not coincidence. You say, well, what do you mean? How do you mean he died figuratively? Well, if I were to take you to that Hebrews 11 passage, I would show you there. It was the wrong one on the screen. It was my fault, but... If I take you there, it would show you. But here, I'll tell you this. Do you know when Isaac died figuratively? Do you know when he died figuratively? He died the moment God told Abraham, take your son, your only son, and kill him. At that moment, Isaac was as good as dead. Abraham saw his son as a dead son at that moment. At that moment, he heard what God said. Through faith, his son was as good as dead. I grew up in a home like that. I grew up with a dad. If he told me to do something, buddy, it better be done. It was as good as done, right? If he said it, it was as good as done. If he told me to do something, it was good done. And if I didn't do it, I knew what was going to happen as good as it would happen, right? God said it. He spoke it. For three days, they went there. He was a dead man walking. Jesus, we know, went into the ground for three days. He went to the tomb for three days after he died. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 4 says, For I remind you of these things which you have been taught, that Jesus died, according to, died for our sins according to the Scripture, was buried and rose again according to the Scripture. The Bible says of Jonah, just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be. Jesus was in the ground for three days. It's figurative and it's real. Type and anti-type. What else? Everyone... Both fathers and both sons had strong confidence in the resurrection of both their sons. Both sons came back. Now, let me tell you about this right here. Look what he said. He told the young men as they were walking. He said, you guys stay here and I and the lad will go worship. But we'll be back in a minute, little bit. He told them we'll be back. Now, wait a minute. How is he going to be back if he's going to kill him and leave him up there on the altar? How is he going to go back? You know what Isaac, I mean, you know what Abraham had? Abraham had faith. You know what he had faith? He had faith. God could only do one of two things. Either God could stay his hand, but I don't even believe he thought God was going to stay his hand. I don't believe he thought for one minute God was going to step in and say, don't do it. I think what he thought was he was going to do it, and he believed that God would raise him from the dead because only a, only a living Isaac could fulfill the promises that God had made to Abraham. He trusted God so much, he said, God had said, I will, make, I will make descendants out of your son Isaac. I will make these descendants. And he had said, you know what, God? It's going to take a living Isaac to do it. So I believe, I believe, I know all my feelings and all my affections and I know all my pain and I don't want to do it and I don't want to whatever. But nevertheless, I will surrender my affections under faith and trust in you and I will do as you say no matter what and I will leave the consequences up to you because you're going to do what you said you're going to do. He had confidence. And then the Bible says, and we looked at that, we read that verse 19. It says, both the men come, they came, down, came back down and they went to Beersheba. They came back. Here's the deal. Jesus was in the grave three days and three nights, but he didn't stay there, did he? There's an empty tomb. To say, to, you ask me how I know he lives, right? There's an empty tomb. Up from the grave he arose. We just did it a few weeks ago, a month ago, whatever. He's alive now. 
Jesus said before he went to the grave, by the way, that was not an afterthought. Jesus said the Son of Man must suffer and die and on the third day be raised again. The prophet said he would do it. Over and over again, there was all this testimony. Jesus was alive. So that leads me to the last thing under this, well, almost the last thing under this section. You notice at the end of the story, the next one, please. You notice at the end of the story, something happens and Isaac isn't killed. God says, don't do it. Don't kill the boy. But then something radical happens. It says, Abraham looks up and he sees a ram caught in a thicket. All of a sudden, the type changes. Everything up to this point has been a comparison, but there's one point of contrast. There's one point that's different between Isaac and Jesus. You see, Isaac, listen, killing Isaac wouldn't have done the work. Killing of Isaac wouldn't have finished the job. Isaac is a sinner with a sin nature like you and I. It wouldn't work. Isaac could not atone for sin. So this is what we call substitutionary atonement. One person dying in the place of another. So it's like a double play. The ram dies in the place of Isaac. But more importantly, Jesus dies in the place of sinners. You see it? It's substitute in the place of. How awesome is that? That God, all the way back in the book of Genesis, 1,500, 2,000, 2,500 years, whatever it is, before the coming of Jesus, is already teaching us that somebody else is going to die in our place. I was writing down some of those words. He and he alone is our propitiation for sin, is what 1 John 2, 2 says. He and he alone. Hebrews 1, 3 says that when he had finished he, when he finished, he and he alone gave himself for our sins and then he sat down at the Father's right hand. The emphasis is on he and he alone. It couldn't be Isaac. All the prophets of the Old Testament together. Moses could not atone for your sin. Abraham could not atone for your sin. Isaac couldn't do it. Nobody, David certainly couldn't do it. Nobody could do it. Your preacher can't do it. The Pope can't do it. Nobody can do it. You're, you're, the, that, that guy you know that's the holy Christian guy in your life, he can't do it. Only Jesus can do it. So what do we learn from this? What is our inspiration? I'll, I'll, I'll rattle them off, but I want you to get it. The Father God alone can provide for our salvation. They call him Jehovah Jireh, right? The Lord God will provide. And by the way, that first and foremost doesn't mean, Jehovah Jireh, I want a fancy car. The Lord will provide. It's not what it means, right? Now, it does mean he can provide just about anything he wants to provide and you need. But primarily, you know what your need is? Do you know what you need? You need a lamp. You need a lamb. But let me tell you this. The lamb that was there, when we think about Jesus and the, and the text teaches us something, the lamb has to be for God because God needs an innocent to die in the place of a guilty because there's sin. But the lamb also has to be by God because only God can produce the type of lamb that will satisfy God's high demand. So you, the lamb has to be for God and by God. Jesus was for God and by God and he was God and he is God. Right? So Father God alone can provide. If you try to come up with any other lamb, my education, my righteousness, my smarts, this person, this church, this religious thing that I do, it'll all fall short. Jesus and Jesus alone. What else though? God hates sin so much, he can only send his son to atone. I said this earlier, God requires a violent and a bloody sacrifice. Listen to me, if you walk away, listen, there are people today that are changing this all up. There are people today who want to take the words like blood out of the Bible and blood out of hymnals and blood out of songs. Listen to me. You need to understand how violent this thing really was. Somebody needs to tell you the truth. An innocent person died. A person without any sin and without any sin nature. A person who was perfect in every way, spotless before the foundation of the world. He and he alone, he died and he died. Listen, you know the story. You've read the Gospels. You know how horrible it was. He died that kind of death. And worse than that, he was separated from his father on the cross and experienced what it was like to live in hell. So if we go and think sin is not that big a deal or it's just a small little thing, listen to me. One drop of sin sent the Savior to the cross. It's not to be toyed with. Well, God doesn't care that much. Well, he'll send a knife and he'll send a cross and he'll send a scourging. 
because he cares that much. Because his holy character has been offended in all that he is. And listen to me. Whenever there's sin, God responds. Now you say he can respond in mercy. He has responded in mercy. Look at the next one. God also loves sinners. He sent his only son to make atonement. Listen to me. Imagine for a moment had God not sent Jesus. You see, that's the alternative. The alternative is you can die in your own sin. By the way, that's an alternative for people today. The alternative is, is that you cannot come to Jesus by faith and trust Jesus as your sacrifice, as your substitutionary atonement. The alternative is, I can take my sin upon myself. I, I can deal with it. I'll tell you what, I've, I've actually helped, I've had people tell me through the years that they'll figure it out when they get there, they'll deal when they get there, that I'm not that bad, that I don't need that bad. I've had people say all kinds of things to me just like that. Now, part of me says that's stupid, but the other part of me, my heart breaks because I know the truth even though they don't understand it right now. I know that, listen to me, you cannot, you, <laughs> to take the weight of the wrath of God on your shoulders for all eternity, I don't even know that there's explanation for that. I don't even know that words suffice other than a darkness that lasts forever. A darkness where there's an eternal darkness and yet there's an eternal fire. A place where people are always thirsty but the thirst is never quenched. Listen to me. God has made a way that you don't have to go and endure that. And the way is His Son. It's not a, it's the only sacrifice that matters. You say, listen to me. I say, listen to you. We listen to each other. God loves sinners. He wouldn't have done that had He not. But here's the deal. He made a way. And the only thing worse than your sin nature, there is one thing worse than your sin nature and that's rejecting the one who came as a substitute for your sin he's like listen to me there's another way don't go that way you say Sean you're a little passionate about it I am because I don't want to see people people that I know and people that I love die in their sins when there's a merciful and a loving God with his arms wide open crying out, come to me. I've already given my son. What more can I give? There is no other way. I'm pleading with you. Come to Christ. Listen. You say it's a divine thing. It's a supernatural thing and he draws people. He absolutely does. Can I explain all of that? No. Can't, you can't get saved without the Holy Spirit. No. But he loves you. God's plan is eternal. He figured all this out before we were ever even born. Faith is how we appropriate it now. Listen, Abraham looked forward. We look back. The Bible says in Roman, I mean, uh, yeah, I'm sorry. The Bible says in Galatians chapter 3 verse 8 that Abraham preached the gospel. How did Abraham preach the gospel? Exactly the story that we just read today. It was forward looking and we look back. It's by faith. I wasn't at Calvary like Jesus was. I wasn't there, but by faith I enter in. I believe what God says. Faith is believing what God has said. And this statement, Jesus was dead, now he's alive. It all preaches all that. So here's the invitation today. Jesus was dead, now he's alive. Put this on the screen. I didn't say go to Moriah. I said come. Go is a different thing. Go is what we do once we've already come. Come is a word of invitation. So I want you to bow your heads with me, not because there's anything sacred about that, but I want us to enter into a place with the Lord for a moment. You want to come with me to Moriah? Imagine for a moment walking up that hill. You picture it in your head? Use your sanctified imagination. You're walking up the hill. Just a father and a son. You're just a, a fly on the wall. The father knows and the son knows. Perhaps it's eerily quiet. Perhaps in the father's mind, he's thinking, you know what he's saying to himself? God has promised, God has promised, God has promised, God has promised. 
You know what the son is saying? I trust the father. I trust the father. I trust my father. You're walking up the hill, and there you are, and there it, you come to the place. Abraham doesn't throw Isaac down on the altar. Isaac hops up on the altar and lays down. He lays his arms out. He says, okay, tie me up. There's probably some shaking. There's probably some quaking, but both are acting in complete faith. Abraham raises that, that knife up, that flint knife up in the air, and he is just about, and listen to me, he will do it. 100% he will do it, and God stops him. God has stopped short of punishing us and our sins for all eternity this very moment because he's made another way. Jesus went to Calvary's cross so that you don't have to So my question to you today is this. Will you come to Moriah? Will you come to Calvary? Will you repent of your sin? All that means is will you turn another direction and say, I'm not Lord of my own life. I'm not in control anymore. I've been a great sinner and I'm in need of a great savior. I believe that Jesus died in my place so that I don't have to die. And I believe that Jesus rose again and I can talk to him right now because he's alive. If that's you, when this service concludes, then I want you to come talk to me or come talk to someone that maybe you came with a friend that goes to church or talk to them and have, and you guys come together and talk to me. I want to talk to you, church. If you're a believer, you say, Jesus has given his life for me. Then you have a responsibility to worship and you have a responsibility to go. And tell others. And I'll leave that as it is and let the Holy Spirit do his work in you. I just want us to just revel in that for a minute. God's love for us. The Father giving up his only son. Would you give up your kids? I wouldn't mind. The father gave his son. Enter in, just push into that for a moment. love is this what great love is this that you would give up your own son for me we're just going to take time to worship we'll have a song listen I'll be here at the front if you do want to talk the altar's open if you just want to come and pray there but you're more than welcome just to sit down and put your head on the pew in front of you, you're welcome to stand up and sing with your arms raised high as the Lord leads. But just worship the one who gave us all for you, but don't leave this place with unanswered questions about who Jesus is. Father, be glorified in all that we do and open the eyes of people today that they might see you for you are and experience the love that you gave. Amen.
Yes, he washed me in his mercy, and he cleansed me with his blood. Now I stand complete, I have been set free, I found life therein. Not the same, I am changed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. By His grace, I am saved, I'm His child forever, I am. Now I have the living water from the well that won't run dry. All the pangs of life have been satisfied by the precious blood of Christ. Not the same, I am changed. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, by His grace I say, I'm His child forever, I am, hallelujah. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Time to cross that river. I will shine in glorious light. When he calls me home, I'll fall at his throne and forever worship Christ. I'll forever worship Christ. I'll forever worship Christ. blood of the Lamb. By His grace, I am saved. I'm His child forever. I am. Hallelujah. 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 To be in his presence, isn't it? It's good to worship him. <clears throat> At this time, listen, um, remind everybody that we have our men's and women's stuff tonight. And, you know, you're welcome to, you're welcome to leave if you're, if you, you know, you're wel everybody's welcome. We're closing in the sense of formally, but if you'd like to continue to, to sing or pray or worship, you're welcome to do it. If you need to go, I know some of you have some commitments. Some of you need to get to other places, and we completely understand. So there's no, no legalism there. Just do as the Lord commands. But if you'd like to pray, then it's still, the altar's still open, and I'll leave that up to you. God bless. Choir 445, see you then.